see. Um, to start off, well, without further ado, let's talk about the Center for Public Health. If we could go to the overview, thank you. Um, the Center for Public Health is a non-governmental, non-for-profit, non-political, and non-religious organization located in Nigeria. It was founded in 1997 to reduce the mortality and burden of infectious diseases and HIV, AIDS, and cancer. For decades, the CPH has advocated for women's health, especially as it relates to cervical cancer, breast cancer, and the human papilloma virus and vaccination efforts. It is proud once again to participate in the committee, Commission on the Status of Women this year. Next slide. Dr. Seafine is our executive director. He founded the CPH it, while he was a student at the University of Nigeria with seven of his friends. While it started as a university-based organization, it has since grown into an international one that is operating in 24 out of 36 of the states in Nigeria and expanding to nearby countries. Next slide. Myself, Nate Alter, and Kevin Gu are youth representatives for the Center for Public Health and also students at Lehigh University. Through Lehigh University's Youth Representative Program, we are able to attend in-person meetings at the United Nations headquarters and advocate for the needs of this Center for Public Health. Our objectives related to the Commission on the Status of Women are achieving universal health care, raising awareness on cervical cancer, breast cancer, and the HPV vaccine, as well as improving menstrual hygiene management. Another issue that we are focused on is research issues and the healthcare worker shortage. The Center for Public Health has helped train thousands of health or hundreds of healthcare workers to provide care to rural populations. The CPH has also set up regional health care centers, as well as the Pink Rose Hospital, to bring medical care to those who would otherwise not have access. Next slide. The Pink Rose Hospital provides free health care treatments and trainings, to, and as well as improvements to over 500 regional health care centers. At the Pink Rose Hospital, they also provide e-visits and an e-pharmacy, patient transportation, home health services, and video consultations. Along with the the services provided at the Pink Rose Hospital, the Center for Public Health also seeks to provide prenatal and pregnancy education to women. Partnering with Every Woman, Every Child, the CPH seeks to reduce the maternal mortality rate and under five mortality rate, increase the proportion of births attended by skilled health professionals, and eliminate harmful practices and discrimination, as well as violence against women and girls. Our second priority is increased awareness about cervical cancer, breast cancer, and the HPV vaccine. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer among women worldwide. Over 300,000 women die each year from cervical cancer. 90% of these deaths occur in low or middle income countries. Many of these deaths are avoidable through the HPV vaccine. The Center for Public Health would like to see HPV vaccination included in all national immunization programs as well as access to regular cervical cancer screenings and treatment op options made available to women who do have cervical cancer. The CPH spreads this message through broadcasts, presentations, training seminars, and more. And it also increased awareness of HPV and its link to cervical and breast cancer. Our third goal of menstrual hygiene management. Many girls are absent absence from school during their monthly menstruation due to limited access to feminine products. <clears throat> the CPH combats this issue by working through volunteers to distribute sanitary pads, as well as through the, the 10 Million Voices campaign. The current issues faced are lack of sanitary pads, lack of menstruation hygiene awareness, lack of basic water sanitation and hygiene facilities, also known as WASH, and lack of private restrooms in schools. The Center for Public Health would like to see governments provide sanitary pads to girls who cannot afford them and schools equipped with adequate facilities for menstrual hygiene management. The 10 Million Voices campaign was started to increase awareness about menstruation issues. Discussions between global partners through accessible online meetings have led to the sharing of ideas and actions to help improve menstrual hygiene management. This campaign does not just apply to menstrual hygiene, it also seeks to raise awareness about the elimination of cervical cancer and reduce hunger. The 10 Million Voices campaign goes to schools, radio and on radio and TV programs, and to religious organizations and village meetings to help raise awareness about these press pressing issues. This campaign also has strived to make sure that all of these changes are made with sustainable practices in mind. 
onto our resource issues and healthcare worker shortage. Along with reduced access to medical supplies during the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been food shortages in Nigeria. The Center for Public Health has helped make a food bank to help alleviate this burden, as well as trained hundreds of healthcare workers to provide care to people who would otherwise not have access. While looking to help create these solutions, the CPH has been making sure to keep in mind sustainability as our choices now impact the future of women's health and global health tomorrow. Finally, if you would like to learn more about us, you can visit our website at the centerforpublichealth.org or email us at info at centerforpublichealth.org or you can join our conversation on Facebook. One of my partners will be uh, entering this information in the chat. Now, um, we will be hearing from the Center for Women's Studies and Intervention. Thank you, Tess, for the introduction. Um, to begin, my name is Grace Enriquez, and I am a UN Youth Representative for the Center for Women's Studies and Intervention. Before I get started today, I wanted to take a few seconds to thank you all for being here with us today. We are really excited to be having these important conversations with you. Um, now that I'm getting started, I will give a quick introduction to the work of CWSI, otherwise known as the Center for Women's Studies and Intervention. To begin, the Center for Women's Studies and Intervention is a non-governmental, non-religious, and not-for-profit organization based in Abuja, Nigeria. The organization is dedicated to ensuring that women can live with freedom and dignity by empowering and upholding the rights of women and the girl child, CWSI aims to construct a just and equitable world. Currently, most of the work is based in the Nigerian states of Abuja, Cross River, Delta, Ebonyi, and Kogi. Through the activities in some of these states, CWSI has been able to empower women and girls and make them aware of their rights and responsibilities as partners in developments. Now I'll take a few seconds to introduce you to some of the CWSI staff members present with us today. Slide, please. Uh, to begin, Sister Ngozi Uti is the main representative for the Center for Women's Studies and Intervention in Abuja, Nigeria, and a Catholic religious nun of the Congregation of the Handmaids of the Holy Child Jesus. She has an MBA in financial accounting from the University Institute of Science and Technology, Cardiff, and a PhD in gender studies from the University of Bradford. She has advanced the Center for Women's Studies and Intervention as an NGO that advocates for the empowerment of women and girls. Next slide, please. Precious Uwubiti is a lawyer working as a gender officer and the programs officer of Center of Women's Studies and Intervention, Nigeria. Her primary role involves programming and gender mainstreaming for the overall goal of the organization. Next slide, please. I will also take a minute to quickly introduce the youth representatives for CWSI. To begin, Lehigh University is a private research university located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. In 2004, Lehigh became the sixth university in the world to become a UN accredited NGO. And in 2008, the first youth representative program was created at Lehigh. The program aims to match high achieving graduate and undergraduate students with UN accredited NGOs that typically do not have adequate representation at the United Nations. Currently, our team has three youth representatives, myself, Grace, an undergraduate senior, Emma, an undergraduate junior, and Relica, an undergraduate junior. Next slide, please. In order to better facilitate our discussion today, I will briefly talk about the mission of our organization. To speak more specifically to the mission, CWSI is committed to upholding the dignity of women and other vulnerable persons through capacity building, advocacy, awareness raising, research, and documentation. In doing so, it aims to address issues of marginalization, oppression, and violence against women and girls in all forms. CWSI also holds core values of courage, accountability, commitment, and integrity. These values aim to inspire the organization to implement initiatives and programs challenging the existing systemic injustices against women and girls in Nigeria. It is important to pursue the empowerment of women and girls as violence against women and girls continues to exist and issues of discrimination continue to persist. If women continue to be excluded or have very few voices at the table where decisions are made, their voices will never be heard and their issues will not be seen as a priority. Ultimately, CWSI is an organization which envisions women, the girl child, and other vulnerable populations empowered, liberated, and active in the creation of a better world. In order to help achieve this mission, since its inception, CWSI has been a vanguard of training women, particularly at the grassroots level. 
CWSI maintains this goal as the organization encourages women and girls to become politically aware, socially responsible, and economically independent. CWSI's goal is the empowerment of women for social rebirth and the promotion of gender equality and equity. CWSI ultimately understands that when empowered, women can become active in the promotion of a better world on a balanced basis with men. Finally, before we start our discussion, I also want to spend some time covering the areas of focus CWSI emphasizes as essential to helping empower the girl child and woman. Next slide, please. Our first area of focus is democratic governance and human rights. CWSI contributes to the inclusion of women in the areas of governance and leadership process by mainstreaming gender and decision-making and sustaining advocacy for the implementation of gender-sensitive laws and policies. The next area of focus is migration and movement of people. CWSI aims at promoting safe, orderly, and regular migration. CWSI further aims at ensuring the protection and empowerment of vulnerable refugees in IDP camps in Nigeria. The next area, economic and poverty alleviation. CWSI promotes and empowers women to be financially independent in order to combat poverty and advance sustainable development of their communities. Next, environment and sanitation. CWSI aims at implementing an environmental protection framework and creating community and institutional awareness on mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And finally, our last area of focus is research and documentation. CWSI aims at becoming a research and documentation center where data and recommended briefs on the advancement and protection of the rights of women and girls are developed. These are our major areas of focus, which will help promote gender equity, yet they also happen to be critical areas that will continue to be impacted in the face of disasters. Moving forward with today's event, it is important to take these critical areas into consideration when discussing today's theme. Next slide, please. For more information on our organization, please feel free to access our websites or social media platforms. We look forward to engaging and connecting with you in the future. Now I would like to give the floor to my teammate, Emma, as we move on to the interactive portion of our event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace, and thank you to everyone for being here today. We'd like to continue this conversation with questions for our panelists who are representatives from both NGOs. These questions will address both the work and the objectives of these NGOs, and also how some of these objectives relate to this year's theme for the CFW, which is achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. For our first question, I'd like to call on Dr. Seafine from the Center for Public Health and ask what are some of the ways that you are working to improve women's health care while also keeping in mind sustainable practices? Dr. Sivan? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much uh, for the question. Uh, I would like to share my slide. Uh, can I share my screen? Let me ask. Yeah, let me share my screen a bit. So I can answer the questions on what we are doing so far to address the women's health in Nigeria. Uh, Nate, can you uh, can you, you enable Doctor C screen? Yes, I just did. Okay, let me just. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, on the question on what we are doing in the Center for Public Health, I thank you so much, um, the special team for the powerful presentation and overview you have presented so far. Uh, for what we are doing in the Center for Public Health, uh, we we'll take the women's health very serious issue because the health of the family and the women of the family depends on women's health. If women are not healthy, it affects the family seriously, especially the children. And the first thing uh, when you come to the, about the cancer, cervical cancer, in women, which is the most second common cancer in the female. It's estimated that 445,000 of women died in 2012. And 
85% of these deaths occur in low and middle countries, especially Nigeria, countries like Nigeria. And when it comes to Nigeria, there's inequity in distribution of health services. Most of the death occurs in lower socioeconomic class. Having said that, it means that in annual cases like in Nigeria, you have about 14,089 deaths in 2012, which means approximately 23,000 women are dying daily from cervical cancer. And what are we doing about this? We started the 10 million voices. We moved into it because most times after the CSW, staying in big hotels, declaring powerful communique, rendering powerful presentation, but it doesn't get down to the grassroots. So that's necessitated the fact that we mobilize the people into the 10 million voices across the world. Currently, we're in 23 countries with 100 coordinators and over 4,000 volunteers. You can see one of our volunteers in the secondary school in Nigeria. This is in Delta State in Nigeria, in the Wari area. This is a secondary school. She's training and educating the people on the prevention and control of cervical cancer. This is one of the controls, the measures we are doing about cervical cancer. And we're mobilizing the young, the youths, the students to demand for HP vaccine. You can listen to this short video about this girl that just, uh, just trained in that secondary school. You can also listen to the teacher that the mobilize. The essence of doing this work, it has a multiplying effect. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mrs. Victoria Ogumbo. Sorry? Good morning, everybody. I'm Mrs. Victoria Ogumbo, Reverend. I'm glad to join this program of the World Cancer Day. We have been enlightened on cervical screening. So we have been informed on the importance of this screening because of the cancer that is spreading everywhere among women. So we have been informed by, by Mrs. Okagbare Deborah. They have given us. Uh, thank you so much. Let me cut it short. So the essence is that when we train the teachers and train the students, they will go back and train their community. Uh, and uh, uh, will actually give them the mandate with an inducement that each person trained should go back and train about 20 people. If we have trained uh, 1,000 people within the community, uh, students and teachers, that means within one week, we are expecting to must have talked to and trained about 20,000 people. This uh, is uh, uh, in Taraba State in the northern part of Nigeria. That's a, these are members of the internally displaced people in the, what we call the northeastern part of Nigeria, where I have a, a Boko Haram terrorists terrorizing the people. These students are staying in the camp. They were trained on the Sabaka. They you can listen to the other. Uh, he spoke in Aosa. He was asking why they've not come since that most of them had passed the age of uh, HPV vaccination. But the essence is that let us catch as much as people we can get. This is. So we continue mobilization in different schools, in different communities, to make sure that uh, not only the elders are being talked to, the students, the youths are mobilized too. You can listen to the child. I am proud to join the fight against cervical cancer. I am proud to join the fight. 
fight against cancer. Thank you, HP also, this is a school uh, in uh, a Kogi state, is another state in Nigeria, in the north central. Their students were trained and mobilized adequately. Uh, so far, we have trained about uh, 85,000 students, and we are expecting each of them to train about 20 more. That will give us almost uh, uh, 1.7 million people reached within one month. So. That's the sense what we have done about cancer issues. The same way we mobilize about, I cannot share the whole pictures and the whole video because of time. Then the major important area, again, about the women's health is the antenatal support. Most of the, because Nigeria, uh, only 10% of Nigerians are covered in health insurance. We see do out of uh, pocket expenses. Most of the people cannot afford to go for antenatal care go to hospital for delivery, that makes them to resort to all sorts of quacks. If you look at the statistics, the maternal mortality rate in Nigeria is so bad that in 2018, 917 people died. That means what we're saying that out of 100,000 pregnancies, 917 people died. Compare it with other countries like uh, South Africa, where I have 119 against 100,000. Um, Senegal is even better than Nigeria. United States, we have 19 women dying out of 100,000. But in Nigeria, almost 1,000 women dying out of 100,000 pregnancy, people that are pregnant. You find out that it's not a crime for a woman to be pregnant. And to reduce this, we now, we now join what we call Save a Million Life, supported by World Bank, federal government, and some state governments. We start mobilizing the, uh, the women going to the villages to give them inducement to come to the health centers to give delivery so that they can be attended to by skilled workers. In fact, Nigerian statistics about pregnant women that were attended to by skilled workers is still bad. Only 43% of pregnant women were attended by skilled workers, while 57% are being attended to by quacks, people not trained to conduct delivery. This is part of the factors leading to the high rate of mortality among the pregnant women. You can see the picture where we are addressing the women. These are the women who have to induce them with 1,000 naira each, about $2 each, to come to the uh, Accenture Care and the Health Center to take care of their transport and other things. And moreover, the Accenture Care is offered to them free by our volunteers. You can see, see the moments of the pregnant women in the uh, local health center. So this is what we are doing for pregnant women. Then another problem in, in um, another problem in women's health that has been neglected seriously is the menopause. Most women know that when their menstruation stops is menopause, but the conditions and other symptoms are not well known to them, like hot flashes, weakness, sweating, Nigeria is a place that all sorts of things, people believe a lot of things. Most of them believe it's a witchcraft. People believe it's a spiritual problem. But we're able to talk to most women in the discussions and the conversation going on. These are what to expect. Most women, they don't know what to expect at a certain age. Immediately a woman crosses the age of 40, 45 years, you should expect that period will start dropping and all these symptoms the perimenopausal signs will start coming up. Most of them are not prepared for this. So the most neglected condition is this menopause. Then what you have to accept is this a disease that should be included in the health insurance plan. Most of the insurance plan does, is not accommodating the supplements and the drugs the women need to really reduce these uh, symptoms and feeling. You can see when we are training, uh, this is a, a group of Catholic women organizations. We're having a meeting with them and training them. That the same people, that's me on the yellow and uh, our support staff there. Then the most important thing when we now uh, on the our experience have shown us that ignorance, poverty, is a major problem. So we started what we call community-based social health insurance program, CBSHIP, to achieve universal health coverage. 
Under this CBH canopy, we encompassed healthcare, reduction of violence against women and girls because a, a contact between us and the women and the families, women empowerment and gender equality. When it came to the contribution for this uh, community-based insurance, we found out that the, the women cannot even contribute as small as $1 per month to take care of the health of their health. So what you have to do is that we incorporated the microfinance banks and they gave them loan for the health insurance and at the same time gave them loan for their businesses. In fact, this program we tested with the Blomberg philanthropist. We came among the first 50 out of 2000 cities that applied, although we didn't make the final 15, but uh, is a good system that we should be adopted, is working in many areas. We use the community mobilization counter to reduce the violence against women and girls, take it to the grassroots, talk about it. But most times in the African setting, is the men that determines what is law and what is normal. So women are not part of this determined group, We've been able to incorporate women in decision-making groups in most communities by reaching out to the elders. You can see our meeting with women leaders, teaching them the importance of being part of community discussion and community uh, decision-making. These are our meeting with the male community leaders. They ascribe themselves the supreme order of dishing out others making a lot of bias, but we've been able to break some of most of these bias that are induced by cultural and religious belief. That's the, uh, the chairman of the com one of the communities we are working on and the deputy. So we really engage them. In fact, we have to take the message to the, to the marketplaces because what we are doing is that to empower the women, you can see our team talking to the women about how they can report uh, violence against women and girls, gender-based violence, how they can be part of the CB shift to benefit health-wise, and take care, and so on. And most of these women have to obtain loan for the microfinance. It is very easy to pay at a very low interest. In fact, they pay daily. It makes it very, very minute that they don't feel when they finish the payment of the loan they took for their business and for the health of their family. You can still see our team talking to the elderly women. This is the market, a, a typical village market in Africa. This is Nigeria. That's a member of our team. So most of the women that talk to the market enrolled into the community-based social insurance. This will help to protect them against violence, gender-based violence, empower them, and then make them a part of the decision-making body in the community. They were so excited. And we combine this thing with uh, uh, the telemedicine. Um, they can sign up to the USSD over the phone, most of them that has a phone, so that in case of emergency, they will contact the center. This program will run with uh, Women Crisis Center, WCC. They're another powerful group, NGO. We are partnering with them in this program. You can see our team, same in the local market. And uh, this is a meat seller, is a male, but you need to be educated about the dangers of uh, not empowering women, violence against women, and other things. Uh, for the people who, who, who are still at home, our team have to go and check their systems. Most of them are hypertensive without knowing, most of them are diabetic without knowing. So we normally go house to house to screen them in the communities we are working through the volunteers. Uh, briefly, these um, uh, uh, girls working in the brother, uh, what they call commercial sexual, uh, sexual workers, we really have to educate them about how to protect their health, how to work, and other things, the dangers of their business, uh, the risk involved, and how to protect themselves. Because most of them, most times, suffer uh, gender-based violence because of the stigma about them in the community. They don't know how to go about it. We maintain a hotline where they can report of any violence against them so that it can be taken up with uh, appropriate quarters. This is our team. Uh, we involve the SZ, what we call the traditional rulers, because they are very important in the community mobilization. 
and they're very important in the decision making. They are part of the program and they're quite supportive. This is a religious leader, is a reverend father of the Catholic faith. Uh, we involve all the religious leaders because most times the bias is coming from religious and cultural beliefs. This is still mobilization in the market. Um, the next is the telemedicine in women reproductive health. We are aware that in the formative stage of the women health, especially the young teenagers, they are too shy to come to the hospital. They are too shy to explain to their parents of what is happening to them. And most times they want to talk without being known they are the one having the problem. So we created this uh, telemedicine platform. We use it during the pandemic COVID to really reach out to them about most times they call hiding their number. They don't want to be identified. So by, by time you start talking and building the confidence and boldness in them, they can easily come out to the hospital and seek healthcare. They are not empowered to pay for healthcare, but we are creating a, a window for them to enjoy affordable and accessible healthcare. To this, we have reached out in a month. We receive almost 2,000 calls from uh, teenagers who cannot afford to open up to their parents or come to the hospital on their own to avoid being condemned. But through this telemedicine, we are able to really calm them down and actually help them out in what they're suffering from. 10 million voices, like I told you earlier, is to talk about most of these issues I mentioned, gender-based violence, empowerment of women, uh, menstrual hygiene, cervical cancer, breast cancer. Currently, we are working on menstrual hygiene and uh, we are trying to create what we call the sanitary pad, uh, menstrual pad bank. We also advocating that all the taxes should be removed from sanitary menstrual materials. And also we're advocating for reclassification of men's sanitary pad to be a menstrual pad. It should be classified as a health product because when they classify it as a sanitary pad, not being a health product, it attracts a higher tax. So we're advocating that all the tampon tax should be removed. We have 100 coordinators in over 23 countries with over 4,000 volunteers. These are still part of our volunteers in other states. This is one of our volunteers. She's in Kenya. Uh, Precious Keveta is a student of, of one of the universities in Kenya. She's doing very well, has mobilized over 200 students to be part of this program. Thank you so much. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephine. We'd now like to turn to Precious from CWSI and continue our questions. How will working to increase female representation in government help advance the situation of women in Nigeria? Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, okay. Equal representation is a very essential element to a functioning and effective democracy. Women's participation in governance and in politics helps advance gender equality and affect a range of policy issues and the type of solutions that are proposed. There is strong evidence that whether a legislator is male or female, it has a distinct impact on their policy priorities. There's also strong evidence that shows that as, that as more women are elected to office, there is increase in policy making that emphasizes quality of life and reflects the priorities of families, women, and on other vulnerable minorities. In order to achieve development goals and to build strong and sustainable democracies where the interest of every um, every group in Nigeria is represented, we must encourage, empower, and support women to become strong community and political leaders. And how do we do that? We can provide um, financial empowerment. We can provide techni technical capacity training for them. We can encourage them. We can fight against um, bias and try and create an enabling environment that is devoid of violence and intimidation. 
And it's only in all these efforts that we can increase female representation because when women are adequately represented in positions of governance, uh, you would see a notable increase in terms of laws that are being made, policies that are being made that reflect the priorities of women's interests. Thank you. Thank you so much, Precious. Now we'd like to move on to the next question. In what ways will uplifting women help mitigate the effects of climate change and or promote disaster reduction? Okay, so women constitute um, a sizable portion of the agricultural labor force and as such are extremely vulnerable to failing agricultural production. As women do not have the same access to financial resources and other resources such as um, climate and uh, market information, their ability to respond to drops in agricultural production related to climate change is very low. The agricultural sector is also one of the leading emitters of greenhouse gases. Therefore, it is important for women working in agriculture to be involved with climate change mitigation. Once engaged, these women can incorporate climate smart agriculture and sustainable farming into their daily lives, thus increasing food security for themselves and for their families. Women are critical to the mitigation and adaptation to climate change. As environmental degradation, as we all know, it leads to increased poverty and hampers sustainable development. So it is evident that in dealing and respond, it is necessary that we deal and respond to climate change in order to achieve gender equality. Today, we have women on the front lines of the fight against climate change and are often the first to respond to protect their families and their communities. They are the ones who most often decide on the daily consumption of natural resources. They play a key role in um, agricultural production and land conservation. They, they majorly use you know, water resources and cooking foil and other resources, and they constitute majority of climate migrants. So, and as such, girls and women are not only well suited to find solutions to prevent environmental deg degradation and adapt to a climate, to a changing climate, they have a vested interest in doing so. Ensuring that women's leadership, agency, and participation in communal, national, and global climate decision making processes is essential to both climate change action and gender responsive uh, disaster risk mitigation. Women have a unique understanding of the impact that climate change is having on the productive assets upon which they depend on and get their source of income. Their perspectives and solutions must be acknowledged. It must be incorpor incorporated into the development of sustainable approaches to climate change adaptation and mitigation. Not only are women critical to helping um, their communities prepare for and respond to the effects of climate change, having women in leadership roles and participating in civic engagement opportunities can also have a positive ripple effect for communities. You know, women are often the knowledge keepers of traditional and sustainable means of natural resource management. And when these methods are applied, they result in more resilient communities and improved livelihoods. Uplifting the capacity of women can help establish new methods to deal with all forms of disasters. We can create um, safe spaces for vulnerable populations during disasters and make sure that at least in our response, they are well educated and, and prepared in addressing um, disasters in their communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Precious. Now I'd like to move on to the next question. How do you approach challenging deep-rooted cultural practices which may be harmful towards women and violate their rights, especially those in grassroots communities? Hello, can, can everybody hear me? I'm on mute. Yes, yes we, we can. can. 
to yes, go with with hands. Is it oh, possible? I apologize. Yes. I apologize for that. Um, where I am right now, it's raining heavily, so we have no light. So hence, I'm engulfed in darkness, so to speak. Yes, but I'll move on to um, answer the questions. Yes, um, CWSI addresses and challenges um, cultural practices which propagate violation of the rights of women and girls through traditional institutional reforms. We carry out community-driven awareness activities, and we also create linkages with support services and legal services for survivors of um, gender-based violence. And then we carry out most of these community-driven awareness activities entails, you know, conscientization and sensitization of, peop of people at the various communities. And sometimes we conduct town hall meetings to try and get every person, every person's interest represented in the development of policies that, that um, protects and guarantees the rights of women and girls in these places. So through most of these reforms and through most of these awareness activities we carry out and um, advocacy visits to major key players in these communities, you know, the traditional leaders and the religious leaders, this too helps transform some of these cultural practices because the leaders themselves, they come together and develop policies having been, um, you know, conscientized on what, what the rights of women are, how most of these practices, um, you know, hampers the progress of women in their communities. So then it, it results in them coming together to develop policies and, and um, bylaws to protect the rights of the women and girls in their communities. Then we also have um, different, you know, um, groups human rights groups, we have the paralegal groups. These are all, um, we have the frontliners, trained frontliners that are to provide um, support services. These are all ways of us trying to create linkages with support services and legal services to ensure that survivors of, the, um, of gender-based violence and other forms of practices that, that are harmful to them, you know, they have access to these things and then they in turn also help in driving awareness activities in other places where we can't reach to. Thank you. Thank you. And to expand on something that you mentioned, what are some of the challenges that you have faced in helping survivors of violence seek psycho psychosocial mental health support? Okay. Uh, you know, Violence can have um, so many effects on survivors, and most of these effects include both physical, psychological, and social effects. And some of the social effects include um, stigma, um, social exclusion, discrimination, sometimes rejection by the family and the communities. And then, you know, they get depressed, they withdraw into themselves, they're thinking of self-harm, you know, and um, suicidal addiction. So due to fears of stigmatization and social exclusion, some of these survivors are reluctant to access psychosocial support, which we provide. We have trained frontliners and we have a therapist who, um, you know, are very readily available to provide um, support and counseling for them through the counseling desk line that we always um, mention during all our community awareness actions. So most of the times due to fears of this and, you know, um, the fear of stigmatization, the fear of social exclusion and discrimination, the fear of I don't want to be looked at as somebody that suffered from this violence or I was raped or stuff like that. They are very reluctant to assess it. But notwithstanding that challenge, we always take into cognizance and assure the women and girls that attend our program activities that the interest of the survivor and respect for her or his decisions is of primary importance. All actions that are preferred and are taken is guided by a survival-centered approach and the principles of confidentiality, safety and security, respect 
and non-discrimination is all considered when, whenever we are handling any case at all. So while we conduct our community awareness action, which engages men, women, youths, persons living with disabilities, we ensure to highlight majorly on reducing stigma and promoting access to services for survivors of GBV. This is um, most of these actions, you know, most of these um, sessions and advocacy led to the gradual first fostering of communal supports and family supports in the places that we're, we have worked in and are currently working in. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for our final question for you, what are the main challenges that refugees and IDP camps face and how is your organization working to address these? Okay, the major challenges faced by refugees in camps um, are poor infrastructure, in, um, poverty, poor sanitary um, conditions, limited access to basic services due to, you know, insufficient financial resources. Officials working in camps. Many of these refugees, they live in dilapidated homes and are financially struggling to provide for themselves. This was also, this was further heightened by the pandemic and the current economic situation in Nigeria. So currently CWSI is carrying out awareness activities on human rights, their rights as refugees, intimate partner violence and other forms of violence against women and girls. We are also helping them to assess support services and law enforcement agencies. We are also empowering the refugees by engaging them in skill acquisition programs, to help them have the capacity to engage as they should in the labor markets. We hope that um, with all these efforts that are being made and you know, with the upscaling of these efforts, we'll be able to help um, these refugees you know, face some of these challenges head on. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for our final question, I'd like to call on both Precious and Dr. Seafine to answer. And the question is, in what ways can the Nigerian civil society sector work together to encompass various SDGs, for example, gender equality and clean water and sanitation? Um, would we like to start with Precious? Okay. Um, a major way that we can, um, all the Nigerian civil society can work together to you know make sure the various SDGs are accomplished is increased collaboration and have to intensify efforts to collaborate together on programs on development programs and projects and we must strive to have strategic coordination of all our efforts and key approaches of intervention to achieve the SDGs then we need to have an improved um, sharing of information and data on human rights issues and the rights of women. If we don't have enough information and data, you know, we can't conduct proper research, we can't document proper data for anybody to assess. Then finally, we need to have improved and stronger partnership in mobilizing resources when it comes to um, implementing our development um, programs and projects in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your answers. And now Dr. Sifine, do you have a response as well? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, like you said, we've started the collaboration. We have what we call the partnership on maternal and child health. We have partnership about the menstrual hygiene of all the CSOs working in menstrual hygiene and SDG 3. We have so many other partnerships, even the one on malaria and HIV, uh, that is ongoing and we keep on adding more CSOs and more blind for sharing of resources and materials. Partnership and collaboration goes a long way in helping CSOs to achieve all their missions and goals. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Kevin.
Vin and Nate who will facilitate the audience questions. Thank you so much, Dr. C. Fine, um, and uh, everyone uh, to uh, speak about CPH and uh, CWSI. Now we'd love to open the floor for the audience. Um, you can type in your question in the chat box, or you can raise hand, and then we'll unmute you, unmute you, and then you can ask your question. You, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I've said it so that if you're ready to ask a question, go ahead. You know, once we call on you, go ahead, Hans. Um, you can just go somebody's ahead. Hand, sure. Somebody's hand is up. Uh, Hollins, do you have a question? Hello. Hello, everyone. Am I audible? Can I go on? Yes, yes of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. I simply want to know um, what is the place of um, the constitution or legislation in these issues? Are there things we expect? Um, are there some kind of body languages we expect from um, the lawmakers to make these programs you know, work out? Because um, when it comes to, um, to women, it's a very delicate um, um, topic. It's a delicate problem, you know? So is there, is there an expectation in this side of legislation that is needed to make this push, to make this project, to make this um, approach more effective? Thank you. Uh, let me take on the answer. Uh, yes, there's a lot the legislation can do. Uh, for instance, in, the, in most countries, their health insurance program are not covering about the problem women are expecting in menopause. In menopause. Uh, most of the drugs you use there to really alleviate the symptoms when it is severe are quite expensive and it is not included in the drugs for most of the country's uh, health insurance program. So I believe this being a natural physiological problem that comes with aging, and most times it presents as a disease, should be included in the natural health insurance program, especially when, uh, especially when most of the women that suffer this are always at their old age, which is a vulnerable age for them to be supported. Secondly, when it comes to menstrual materials, uh, is it part of the legislation to reclassify menstrual parts as part of health products? Unfortunately, during the COVID, when we are stockpiling some palliatives, when I told them that we have to include uh, menstrual parts, they were surprised. They, they don't feel it's necessary. But this is ultimately necessary, especially when there's a lockdown and there were limited supplies. Because they were not classified as a health product, most of the industries were not producing it. Everybody uh, faced the production of health materials, which made it, made it to be scarce during this period. So we advocate that this should be reclassified as a health product. Totally, and taxes on the menstrual material like tampons, uh, menstrual pads should be removed to make it affordable for the people. Also, we advocate that if condom can be distributed freely in the hotels, malls, airports, during sports festivals, why can't scientific parts shoot? Why can't we distribute scientific parts being a physiological issue? Most women in the airport, they find them being based on the emergency, they don't know where to pick it up. So all these things should be in the public space. I think this is where the, the legislation should come up in the women's health. Thank you. Okay, so from my angle, um, yes, we expect the legislators to do a lot when it comes to, you know, pushing gender equality and protecting the rights of women. Times and um, time and time again, we've had pushback and rejection of the gender and equal, uh, gender and equal opportunities bill, 
we saw recently in um, the beginning of March where five pro-equality bills for women were rejected. But then again, we're hearing that three bills have been recalled. We don't know exactly how true that is. But you can see that a lot of work still needs to be done in terms of, you know, um, advocating to, you know, the National Assembly and the State House um, of Representatives on issues that concerns women. Most of the times when you meet these legislators, they tell you that they are trying to listen to the voice of their constituents. And that, you know, because of culture and religion, some of these bills would, you know, cause controversy and all of that. In 2022, we're still fighting for them to, you know, um, assent, um, sorry, we're still fighting for the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill to still be recognized by the Senate. And this bill is designed to secure the rights of women and girls in the country to equal opportunities. And if we consistently have stories and excuses of they are listening to their constituents, we are working with these constituents. And the majority of them, want what's right for the women too. So I think the only way we can use, um, the only way we can address this effectively is to come together, you know, coordinate all our efforts and intensify our advocacy on this. Those areas that, you know, sensitization have not been done, you know, that needs more awareness on these bills that are on ground, what people stand to achieve when they are passed should be made by the Nigerian civil and society sector. Thank you very much. Let me chip in something there about the bill she said was rejected in the National Assembly. Uh, yeah, where we are having a little problem is in the, uh, the misinterpretation of gender equality. Uh, we'll be having this effect of what we call, I call it um, yes. some feminist might not define what they are fighting for. Gender equality is about opportunity, giving male and female equal opportunity in education, career, politics, and other things. But uh, our Muslim brothers and sisters, uh, especially our Muslim brothers, felt that gender equality is talking about marriage. We do you want to make the man equal to them in the marriage, which most of them see as a taboo. So, but in most of the communities who worked in, in the Northeast were able to explain to them that there's a difference between gender equality and interfering in marriage. When you talk about gender equality, you're talking about women and men should be given equal opportunity in attaining any heights they want to attain. Seeking for employment, business, seeking for loan, property inheritance, and other things. But when you come to marriage, it becomes a sensitive issue. So uh, after the rejection, we told our volunteers to move into the field to really explain that this gender equality, because most of the lawmakers are scared that we use their support such thing. By the time they come back to their constituency, they might be stoned. So you find that it's a very delicate issue, unless all these things are very well defined. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seafine and Pressures uh, to answer these questions. We have a lot, a lot more questions in the chat box. Uh, we have a question from Adubzi. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that name correct. Uh, is how can people help your uh, help uh, you know, the organization, both CPH and CWSI? Uh, come again, I didn't get the question. Sorry, uh, so how can people help your organizations? There, there are many ways people can help the organizations. You can volunteer your time. I call it three T's. Is your time, your treasure, or your talent? Time, you volunteer, you can join the outreaches, talking to people, uh, attend our trainings, virtual and physically. Then treasure, you can, if you have the money, you can donate as much as you want that's comfortable for you and convenient for you. We are not asking anybody. Then talent, skills. We have people who are talented in IT. Uh, you can design a lot of flyers and all these things. You can contribute that or be part of the advocacy online. So these are the ways you can help. And also if you have any problem in your community, you can bring it forward that 
this is my community, this area I work, this is where I want intervention. We can now see how we can come in and help. Thank you. Okay, just to add my bit here, um, just like what Doctor has said, um, the various ways that people can help our organizations in ensuring that most of our programs, you know, reach the interior areas of Nigeria, you can volunteer your time, you can volunteer your resources, of course, and we're not going to task you on the amount you should donate, whatever you feel is necessary. Because most of the times, the target groups we work with, which are mostly women and girls, their major challenge is, you know, um, they don't have enough financial resources. So aside volunteering your time and, you know, financial resources to our organizations, we also have, have um, the option of advocating online and also advocating in person in any area that you are living in. You could directly reach us through our website that we'll provide for you in the chat box so that you could contact our admin officer or any other officer in the organization. If you have um, you know, a plan, an advocacy plan to someone in your community or in your state, and they'll work on it together and see how you can stru structure it properly for you to implement there. The more people are creating awareness in, their dif in the different states of Nigeria, the better we will be in you know, advancing the progress of women in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone, um, you know, posting and uh, keep the chat box active. Uh, we have another question is, um, is the government support your efforts or is it part of the problem? Yes, in some areas, government uh, will seek uh, government support to use their resources uh, because most of the health centers we are trying to refurbish and bring into life belong to the government. So sometimes we seek partnership with them because we use their platform, we use their resources to reach out to the people. So that's the way the government can support, but it's not compulsory for them and we don't touch them except if we find areas like when we reach out to schools to talk to the students, the property belongs to government, that's part of their support and not actually financial support. Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes, um, we do work with some of the government um, agencies and ministries. Um, in Kogi State, we recently implemented a project together with the SDGs office there in Kogi State. You know, most of the times we need um, some key persons in these ministries to help us reach out to more um, people and um, key stakeholders that can help advance, you know, policies that advance the progress of women. So yes, and most of the times we work with the ministries, like the Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development, the SDGs office in um, the different states that were mentioned earlier, which is Kogi State, Ebony State, Cross River, and Delta State. They are a major player in helping us, you know, do um, policy reforms and, you know, strategic legislative um, advocacy. Thank you. Thank you both for the insights. Uh, we have another question. How can someone or an association collaborate with you to ensure females in our communities also benefit from your service? Um, yes, we are trying to reach out to as many communities as individuals as possible. If um, we, we have a volunteer within the community there, who should, who, that will serve as what we call the community liaison officer, CLO, and uh, we're able to set up our structure in such community and implement most of the policies for their benefit. So it's for the person to contact the organization and say they're interested for such activities to be held in their communities. That will be done. Yeah, same too here with um, CWSI. Like I said, you could easily reach us through our website. Our contact information are provided there. 
you reach out to us, you know, we set up either a virtual meeting or physical meeting to discuss exactly what can be done in your area. You know, we identify the major problems there, what you are, you know, offering to volunteer and all of that. The more we reach out to more women and girls, the better for, you know, every one of us. Thank you. Um, again, we would love to hear from the audience. If you're feeling comfortable to unmute yourself and uh, we'd love to come up front to ask your question. Uh, we have a question from Dam uh, Damaris. Um, uh, I think this is more targeted to CWSI. How many persons in Lagos be of help, for, uh, be of help uh, to create awareness on the projects and work of CWSI? Okay, I think I've addressed that earlier, but we, there's no particular number of persons that can help create awareness on our projects. We welcome as much persons of, you know, persons that have um, deep commitments to, to, you know, creating awareness on women's rights and human's rights in, in general. You know, you are committed, you have integrity, you have the courage to go into places to, you know, make moves that for the progress of women, then of course we can work together. Thank you. Sorry, I hope everyone heard me. Was I too fast? I could take it slow again. No, no, no. That, uh, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, okay. we, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. do, do we have any more questions uh, uh, from the audience? Yes, I dropped our contacts in the chat box. Uh, if you're interested to work with us or volunteer for one of our services, uh, you are free to contact me uh, for collaboration and partnership in your area. So uh, any capacity you feel that is fine. We have a lot of programs coming to the 10 million voices. By May 28th, we'll be celebrating <clears throat> World Menstrual Hygiene Day. So you are highly uh, welcome to be part of it. We are mobilizing to distribute menstrual hygiene materials in many rural areas, and I guess we cannot afford it. We are also interested in producing reusable parts for the sake of the environment. And if you are interested to, <clears throat> you can contact us and we'll talk more on collaboration. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for sort of coming and, you know, thank Dr. Sifan, thank you for those remarks as well. I know CWSI also has some closing remarks we'd like to do. So if you'd like to go ahead and do those as well, Sister Mbuzi, thank you. Yeah, good evening to you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear Hello, you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Hello? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'd like to thank every one of you who have been part of this event. You know, it's quite amazing when you start and um, it's quite interesting to know about what is happening out here in Nigeria. There is actually no way we can exhaust the issues that need to be addressed or put out there for public consumption and for people who would want to know what is happening or what we're actually doing to put a smile on the faces of our many brothers and sisters who seem to or who live on the margins of society. That's what it is. For us as CWSI, we work with those who really live on the margins of society. We work at the grassroots level, where you really have to come to the level of what people, people who do not really understand what you're talking about. We're talking about 
um, equality. What does that say to a woman who is being battered on a daily basis? What does that say to a woman who cannot afford food or to put food on the table for her family? You know, these are challenging issues that seem ridiculous and seem unbelievable for certain people. And uh, Dr. C. Fine talked about healthcare services. For many, healthcare is not affordable. It's not affordable. And these are areas where we need a lot of effort put. Our brothers and sisters in the diaspora, some of them would want to reach out and help. But the issue is, how do they go about it? And so now that you have all, as those of you who have attended this uh, event and have participated, you have our contact. I, it will be very much appreciated if you will also try to spread our contact and our work with what we do. If you go to our website, you'll get more of what we do and how you can help. I was very impressed and excited to see that there are people who are opting to say, how do we help? And I sincerely hope that it doesn't just stop on the text message with the text message that has been posted on the chat box. I want to see some kind of proactive action that you will say, okay, I attended, I participated at this event, and now I want to follow it up and offer my services, my talents, my advice, whatever it takes to see that the issues of women, to see that the issues of women are addressed properly and the way it should be. I would like to thank um, Dr. C. Fine who also has partnered with our organization. This is not the first time we are partnering with you at the CSW event. We had one in 2017 uh, in New York together. You were not there, but your interns were there. But above all, I'd like to thank the interns at Lehigh that represent CPH, uh, Center for Public Health, and Center for Women's Studies and Intervention. I must say that you're doing a great job because from far away where you are, you keep thinking of what you can do for us and with our people. You don't live here. You've never been here. But some of you know even much more than we who live here seem to know. And for that, I say uh, thank you very, very much for that commitment and that interest. And I hope that even after your years of studies, you will continue to partner with us wherever you are. Having put in so much, I don't think it will be proper for you to just let it be, um, let it remain at that level. I hope it will not just be something you're doing to earn a qualification, but something that will also increase your passion for humanity and to see that many more men and women, especially women and children, live a better life. I think on that note, I will say thank you all to you. Uh, thanks very much to all of you who have participated. I know that many of you have also joined from other parts of the continent. I can see some people from Kenya, those from the Cameroon, those from the US and from many parts of Nigeria. Thank you for joining us. And I hope that someday when the COVID-19 pandemic and all this protocol is over, we shall be able to meet someday in New York where it has always been and where we can interact at a more pers on a more personal level to exchange pleasantries and to see how we can work together, collaborate to make things happen for a better Nigeria. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure from Lehigh, uh, from Elena and um, six uh, uh, youth rep here. We're really a pleasure to work with you and also Dr. C. Fine um, and you know many other staff members and uh, the, and teams uh, from both CWSI and CPH. It was a pleasure for us, you know, to be engaged in a conversation like this and really bring women's health and then uh, you know many other issues uh, we're currently facing, whether you know, it's in the US, in Nigeria, or any part of the world. And um, 
this is my second time uh, presenting uh, in a meeting like this uh, in the seminar. Uh, it was a pleasure again to be here and thank you so much for joining us. And Dr. Seafine, do you have anything to add? I really appreciate everybody attended here, the youths from the Lehigh University. You could have done so much over the years, helping the people who have never seen their face or you might not see their face. In fact, the yeah, activities in the United Nations have projected the associations, both NGOs, to a very higher level. I say I appreciate you. For all the people that attended here, I've seen Dr. Esto Kafo, is a very strong philanthropist, supporting a lot of things in Africa. I've seen Dr. Mamua Ekeleme and Co. Uh, Dr. Agocha, I really, really appreciate your presence and all the attendants. Your questions are really appreciated. So I would like you for more contacts. You want us to work together and collaborate or partner, contact us. We are going to work together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sifan. And yes, if you want to contact any of the uh, any of the organizations, uh, the contact information is on the screen right now. You can email CWSSI uh, through their uh, Yahoo email address or uh, email CPH at info as uh, central for public health.org. And yes, uh, Dr. Sifai and Sister Ngozi, hopefully uh, after the pandemic is over, we would love to welcome you, you know, come back to Lehigh campus again uh, to give us uh, uh, such an inspiration speech to Lehigh students. And also hopefully we'll see you again uh, in UN headquarters in New York. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you.